All set? Hi. Advances in aviation automation <clears throat> are designed to enhance the flight operations for those professionals manning our world's aircraft. Yet some of the newest airliners, even with the latest technology aboard, have crashed under circumstances that never could have been anticipated. Clear days, light winds, experienced pilots and, and crew. So why, why could this possibly happen? Well, we're gonna to try to shed some light on that question and, and get you some answers in today's edition of Book Trib On Demand Author One-on-One -on -one Interviews. I'm Jim Alcon, I'm the editor, editorial director of Book Trib, the leading source of book news and reviews. Jack Hirsch is the author of two marvelous books written from a very personal perspective. His first book, which came out about a year ago, Death March Escape, is the harrowing account of his father's experience in and escape from a Nazi concentration camp. And Jack's story of uh, years later visiting that camp to put the whole book together. Um, his second book, uh, which is available now in Europe and will be available in the US November 20th, it's entitled The Dangers of Automation in Airlines, Accidents Waiting to Happen. Let me just hold it up for you. That's what it's gonna look like. If you see these all little yellow things, that, that's, that's how invested I was in reading it. Uh, you know, I, I was taking a lot of notes. There was a lot of fascinating stuff in there and you, you really, uh, I, I really recommend it. Among other things, Jack is an instrument rated commercial pilot. And today we're gonna make you feel like a fly on the wall really in the cockpits of some of the planes that experienced automation, automation issues and actually failed. Now, some of the cases, uh, some of the planes averted disaster, but you know, rest assured, you'll be, you'll be safe with us. Jack, how are you doing? How are you today? I'm good, thanks for having me, Jim. Well, we're glad, we're glad you could join us. First, before we get into the book on, on automation, let's talk about Death March Escape. It came out about a year ago. Um, it was honored with the, the 2019 Spirit of Anne Frank Human Rights Award. And I wanna point out that rights is spelled W-R-I-T-E-S. Uh, that, that caught me too, but uh, that, that's terrific. Now, in, in the past year, I'm just curious, what, what has the reaction been? What do people say to you about the book? What kind of people are, are talking to you? Just really anxious to hear. Well, the, the book's actually done really well. The, the, the kind of people, it's been across the globe. It's been, I've gotten emails and, and uh, other contacts from places that I'm, I'm very surprised by. Um, the reaction to the book has been almost uniformly excellent. People, people you know, I knew my dad's story my entire life. Um, he told it off, and, you know, he escaped twice from concentration camp, as I would tell people, if you escaped twice from the Nazis, you'd be telling people about that. Um, but he told it in this engaging, interesting, entertaining way. And I really never had any idea of how horrific it was until he actually went to the camp and walked the death march routes. He escaped from two death marches. I walked those routes. Um, I walked the grounds of the camp and saw where he worked. And I tried to convey that in the book. And I think judging by the reaction to people, by people who have either reached out to me in one way, shape or form, or people I saw at conferences, or when I spoke about the book, it seems that I, I accomplished what I set out to do, which was A, describe my father's story in a way that people really could viscerally understand it, and B, describe my story of learning all these things that I hadn't known except for the high concept version of his story. When I tell people about the book, uh, the, the, you know, and now granted, you wrote a whole book on, on the topic, but I'll say, he didn't escape once, he escaped twice. And, and you tend to think, how can anybody escape? How will anybody have the opportunity to escape a second time? Is there some way you can tell us, sort of condense that and tell us quickly? Yeah, well, so first of all, if you escape once and you're not recaptured during the war, you had no way to reach out to anybody. So those people couldn't really tell their story. But more, but, but if you were recaptured, 99.99% .99 of the time, they would have killed you. The fact right. that my That's father, yeah, the fact that my father was not killed um, is, almost inexplicable but in his first escape he was eventually and he eventually ended up in a jail and I believe that his jailer the guy the, the the gendarme who ran the jail was sympathetic to my father possibly because my grandfather my father's father fought in the Austrian army in World War Austro-Hungarian army in World War One and this this gendarme was old enough to have been a compatriot of, of my grandfather so for whatever reason he managed to get my dad back into the camp untouched. And then a week later, there was a new death march, and my father found an, actually a happenstance opportunity to escape a second time, 
and what was the first one was happenstance too, I suppose. And he took that chance. And this time he was found by a local family hidden for three weeks till the Americans came through. And here I am. Well, again, a ver very personal account and, and as, as is the dangers of automation based on your experience as a pilot and everything. So you certainly have a vested interest there. Let's turn our attentions to the dangers of automation. Sure. So you virtually take readers into the cockpits of these nine specific flight incidents in which flight technology had a major effect. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about how the book is structured and, and what readers can expect? Right. Well, so as you point out, I really wanted readers to understand why automation fails when it does. It could be because automation is working too well. It could be because pilots don't realize what the automation is supposed to do. It could be because the automation completely failed. Um, and, or it could be the, the automation surprised a pilot. So I could describe that, or maybe better, I actually put the, pilot, the, the, the reader in with the pilots so they can see minute by minute and second by second what's happening in the cockpit, why the surprise happens, why the pilots don't realize, or, or we seem to think the reason is why the pilots don't realize what's happening is actually occurring. So that's, that's the core of the book. But I also give you a history of airliners and airlines uh, in part because I think you need context to understand kind of how we got where we got. I give you a history of automation. So again, you can get a little bit more context. And then the last piece, which is early on in the book, um, I make an attempt to explain how airplanes fly in such a way that a pilot will find it interesting, but a non-pilot will, non will find it understandable. You can understand why these planes crashed without knowing how planes fly but you're gonna be missing a big important part of it. That you, you, you can understand that in the 737 MAX issues, software ran amok. That, and that, I mean, that English is, is simple enough, but understanding what the software was doing, understanding what the pilots were doing to counter that software, and so give themselves a chance to live. Um, if you understand that, then you really get what happened to the 737s, and that's what I try to do for the reader. You know, so, something else that I think you try to do to the re for the reader is, is really make it, you, you add the human drama. Now your first book, uh, the, the human drama speaks for itself with Death March Escape. I just wanna read the first sentence of, of, of this book because it, it's, you know, it, it, it's nothing, nothing it, it just, it explains just that these are normal people going to work in the morning. Let me, let me just read it, it'll just take a second. Sure. On the last night of her life, 24 year old first officer, Rebecca Shaw was fighting a head cold. It had hit her that morning and was causing her to sniffle, but it wasn't bad enough to keep her from her job as co-pilot for the Colgan Air. Um, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, so, so you just get a sense that already I'm, 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 I'm engaged with that. And, and you know, here, I, I know what's gonna happen, of course, because I, I know what the book is about as, as would anyone, but you're really taking it to a personal level that these are real people that, that are trying to manage and trying to fly a very complex machine. Yes, and, and look, there are in very round numbers, something like 300,000 airline pilots around the world. And with almost no exceptions, every one of them is good at their job. Some of them are great at their job. No one is not good, no one. That's how they got there and that's how they stay there. But sometimes they can encounter things where good is not good enough. And you know, certainly when you're a passenger in an airplane, you don't want just good, you want great. And again, I think most pilots, the vast, vast majority of the 300,000 are probably close to great, but they could be better than they are. And those accidents prove that be, with automation at the level that, that it's at today, we're probably not quite where we need to be. Well, you know, there's, all, there's the old joke about the doctor who graduated <laughs> last in his class. You know, the doctor, somebody is right. there. But right. let's, well, let's, let's talk about, let, let's talk about just you know, the, the theory that you kind of advance on flight, the flight technology, it certainly has many advantages, but it also raises important questions about the alertness of the pilots who have the luxury with this great technology. The technology has gotten so great that I guess, I guess that's where the expression autopilot comes in. You know, they have the luxury of sitting back, watching the air, you know, watching the automation fly the plane for them. But then if there's a crisis or something goes wrong, have they sort of gotten lulled into, uh, you know, just off their game a little bit? Tell, tell us about Well, the word is actually complacency. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a simple English word, but it's actually in, in, the, in the world of human factors, which is the world of how humans relate to automation of any, of any way, shape or form, whether it's a cotton gin mill or, or it's an airplane. Um, human factors are, are extremely important. And the, the risk you run when automation is too good is that pilots or the users of that automation become complacent. 
Um, conversely, what they might also become is excessively absorbed, they call it. They, they're too focused. If, if they're complacent, they're not paying attention, they're at 37,000 feet and, and 700 miles an hour and everything is perfect and it's beautiful. And when you're at 37,000 feet in the cockpit of a plane on a nice day, gorgeous doesn't go far enough to describe it. And you're sitting there and it's everything is working perfectly and it's, you, you, it's still your job, as perfect as things are, to make sure everything stays perfect. And they've tested for humans' ability to notice things that have gone wrong when everything seems great. And we often don't spot things and it's their job to spot it. And when they don't, or when they don't see clues or worse, when something suddenly goes violently wrong, they're thrown from this, this lackadaisical complacent mode of, of, the, of being into they have to become fighter pilots in, in an instant. And not everyone can pull that off, but that's, that's the, the challenge of, of human factors engineers and of, of dealing with complacency. Well, when you talk about the human factor, I mean, is, is it a question? We talked about, you know, they, they were good pilots and they were better pilots and they were worse pilots. Is, is it really subjective sometimes when they see something happening or is it automatic that, 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 that okay, this is malfunctioning, so I need to do this? Or is it, sub is it sort of open to interpretation among the pilot and the, the co-pilot? It, it's really pretty much not open to interpretation. There are things you uh, need okay. to know how to do almost every single time. And but but it's like for instance, in one particular crash, um, the the, cra the plane that crashed in San Francisco, um, the beautiful Saturday kind of late morning, early after it was late morning when it when it went down, there was no understandable reason for this plane to go down. Not only did the pilot do a very poor job of bringing the plane in towards the runway, but at one point. He changed something with the throttles and that changed something with the auto, auto throttle, the automatic mode throttle was on. He didn't realize. If he did realize, we don't know. But if he did realize, um, he didn't know what that meant and it caused him to crash. So there's so much that pilots need to, to know these days with automation and there's not a lot of room for um, creativity. I mean, yeah, pilots, you know, when, when a plane, they, they need to know how to react to a stalled airplane. Um, to emergencies, but virtually everything that they're going to react to, they can practice reacting to it. Well, you know, it's funny, when I was reading, reading it in the book, I was thinking, you know, I remember that crash because I was in a hotel in San Francisco flying out of San Francisco later that day. And I remember, you know, the airline, the whole you know, airport was in chaos because of that. And I remember, yeah, this is, this is the one, this, that's the day we were there. And right. when I, Gorgeous you know, day. Everything. But, but sometimes in the book, it seems like the members of the crew are, are kind of discussing with each other or wondering, why did he do that? Why did he do this? So, so tell me about that. Right, but again, when a crew member is wondering why another crew member has done something, yeah. um, there's got to be a definitive answer. You know, in in the um, uh, in the 737 Max crashes, one of the questions I had initially was: both of these planes took off, and from the instant they they cleared the ground, things were going wrong. Yet the, the Ethiopian plane didn't crash for about four minutes, and the the Indonesian plane didn't crash for 11 minutes. Why didn't the pilots just turn around and land on the runway? And I've got friends who are fighter pilots and friends that are airline pilots and they're all uniform in their answer. The answer is because nothing in their checklist said they needed to. So instead they believe they had essentially a good working airplane. Let's just figure out what's wrong. Let's get some altitude under our wings and figure out what's wrong and then go do what we were supposed to do which is take our passengers where they're supposed to go. And that's how pilots tend to behave. They're checklist oriented. They are yes and no black and white personalities. And unless there is a clear reason, a clear defined reason why they should end the flight by, by turning around and landing, they're gonna do the things they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it. Let me ask you, is the, the technology itself, I mean, is it pretty reliable? Can we count on it? And, and, the manu and manufacturers, are they sufficiently providing the pilots with the information they know to understand it and, and use it? Well, the short answer to your question is yes, absolutely. But, and the but is, well, you see the example with Boeing not, not telling people about the MCAS, the software that was there, because the 737 MAX has got a bit of a design flaw that they're using software to get around. Um, it happened that there was a radio altimeter, a device that tells the airplane electronically how high it is off the ground that caused the crash in a Boeing 737-800, unrelated to the quality of the airplane itself. And there again, some manufacturers, some, some air, airlines knew that this problem existed and others did not. 
But for the most part, we tend to know all the things about automation, what it is and isn't capable of doing. Yet, Qantas had an airline encounter a one in 28, mil, 28 million millionth likelihood of occurrence. Uh, in other words, it wouldn't happen in thousands of years, but it happened to this airplane. And pilots need to be ready for that off the charts, unexpected, no chance in the world event that actually does happen to them. No, I mean they're 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 in they're in a very important role of responsibility for sure. So for so, sure. Um, it, it, could you take us through one of the incidents, maybe just a little bit of what happened, just so we can get a flavor of that? Yeah, uh, I, I think an, an easy one to sort of follow and, and to understand why this was such an interesting topic to me is actually the Asiana 214 crash, the one that crashed in San Francisco a few years back on on as I said a beautiful late morning Saturday. Um. So when pilots learn how to fly airplanes, one of the most important things they're gonna learn how to do is to land the plane. And landing is a little bit of a sport. It's, it, you really have to be able to visually judge your landing. And when pilots begin to fly, they all know how to do it. But if they're gonna to spend too much time on automation, there's gonna come a point where they're gonna lose, it's a perishable skill. It's like any sport, you don't keep practicing the sport, you're gonna lose the skill. There's gonna come a point where they're not gonna be good enough. Well, there's electronics that every airplane has that can, that can draw, that can, that can find the line that's drawn in the sky from, from let's say 10,000 feet, or it's really about 5,000 feet, down mm -hmm. to the ground. And if you're gonna use automation, you're gonna follow that line down to the ground. By, again, by using this automation, you're going to get a, a, a picture in front of you that tells you, are you above the line, are you below the line, or are you right on the line? Well, this Asiana pilot with 10,000 hours, as I said, when he started flying, he knew how to land. But By, by the way, so I just want to interrupt because, because that, that's an interesting point you make. You usually describe in the book how many hours of, of, of flight experience these pilots have that right, really helps put it in perspective. It's usually astronomical. And so he's, he's got 10,000 hours in the air, but I can bet you that for 9,500 of those hours, he was spending his, a lot of that, most of that 9,500 on, on automation. And only in the first few hundred was he actually spending a lot of time with his hands actually on the controls. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so this, it happened that that day in San Francisco Air International Airport, that line in the sky, that electronics wasn't working. So now he's got to land the plane by looking which shouldn't be that challenging, but that was problem number one for him. It was challenging. And, and remember he's handling a 400,000 pound airplane going at starting at 500 miles an hour, trying to slow it down to hundred and let's call it 40, 50 miles an hour. That takes work and skill. And he was blowing it. But at one point, well, eventually he actually got it right on the line that would have been there if the electronics were working when he was pretty close to the ground, but in the process of getting to that perfect point, he made a change to one of his automation devices, auto throttle, which, which is an automatic throttle. That change meant that auto throttle wasn't gonna do what he was then expecting was gonna happen. And when it didn't work, he didn't realize it. And when he didn't realize it, he became so focused on the idea that it wasn't working. He never tried to contemplate, why isn't it working? Is there something else I can do? And it led to the crash. So there was two automation failures here. One, a simple automation failure by this device at the airport that wasn't working, shouldn't have been a problem for anyone, and it wasn't a problem for anybody. It's a beautiful that pilots take, get their job because they love to fly. No one would love more than to land an airplane on a beautiful Saturday afternoon. That was failure number one. And failure number two was this pilot not being able to handle the approach and not realizing that his auto throttle wasn't doing what he wanted it to do and they crashed. So, Jack, we, we, we've talked about this. Um, the book focuses on nine flight incidents. And you point out yourself in the book that, that that is just a very small percentage of the total number of flights. So it's not like, you know, while, while the, these failures are, are, are very interesting and, and you, you, know, you, you sort of take us through them point by point, um, if, if, these flight, if, these, if these accidents are just such a small percentage of what happens, tell us why, why you wrote the book. Well, to me, and first of all, yes, you're right. Very, very low percentage likelihood of any accident happening. But when an accident does happen, we lose hundreds of lives at one time. And it's not an insignificant little issue 
to those hundreds of people and especially to the thousands of people behind them, their families. So I think it's an important topic. But, but secondly, you know, I talk to pilots all the time when I get aboard airplanes and most American pilots like to hand fly their planes up to 10,000 feet and then below 10,000 feet on the landing. Most European pilots do not. And most European airlines actually essentially edict their pilots to, hand, to, to use automation as much as possible. It's not working in our system to have pilots use automation as much as possible and spend once every few months in a simulator practicing the what if scenarios, if this automation goes bad, if that part of automation goes bad, it's not enough. And it, we, we see that it's not enough because we see what happens when something does go wrong and pilots can't land the plane on a beautiful, a beautiful Saturday afternoon. So I think that the training regime that pilots are in needs to change. You know, a lot of pilots own their own airplanes. Great. They know how to land. They know how to fly. They have their hands on the controls a lot. But that's not true of all pilots. And that's not true of the really good pilots who need to be great pilots once in a while. We need to get them more training more often with their hands on the controls. And I think if I can point out the importance of that, then I'll have, I'll have accomplished something by having written this book. So certainly uh, the book to a large degree geared toward professionals and people in the industry that, that should be aware of this. Well, uh, I, I like to believe I wrote it for anybody to be able to, anybody with, with no plain background at all, but just an interest in it to be okay. able to read it. I mean, frankly, even this, the few chapters about how airplanes fly, I think if you don't read it, you will, you will miss an important part of the book, but you won't not understand the rest of the book. So for the average person who is not in the industry, uh, you know, and I, I asked you before, is this going to make readers, you know, scared, are they going to be scared to fly after they read your book? You know, I, I don't think it's going to change anybody's mind about whether they're scared or not. If you're, if you are nervous as a flyer, um, which as a pilot myself, I'm not totally sure I understand, but if you are nervous, this probably isn't going to make you feel any less nervous. <laughs> um, but perhaps it also might, because you do also see that in the hands of a skilled, there, there's, as you said, not all of them are, are crashes, some of them are incidents. In the hands of a skilled pilot, look what Sol Solen um, uh, Chesley Sullenberger did in landing um, the U.S. air flight into the, in the Hudson River. Look at the Qantas airplane pilot who handled that one in 28 million chance of something going wrong. He was, actually was trained in Top Gun in, in the U.S. Navy. Look what he did. There are really phenomenal pilots out there, and they're interesting stories. And I think that, that you'll say to yourself, perhaps, well, I don't need Sullenberger in the front there. I've got automation. The odds are super low. I'm good. You know, we were talking before we, we, we started the interview that, that you mentioned you were on a flight and you detected something that, that the average person would not detect. Yeah, that suddenly, wasn't good. There's the power of knowing too much, right? There, you, that you was know? not good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I knew a little too much. But I'm, I'm curious, just in your own flying experience, have you ever had any real close calls or anything that... that uh, Actually, nothing. Now, I mean, I left a seatbelt hanging out once, which it's, it's, it's some, not all the seatbelts are on inertial reels. And I actually was checking out the plane and it, it, there was a door on either side and yeah. I had no passenger. And I left the passenger seatbelt out the door and it was banging and rattling and scared the daylights out of me for about 15 seconds. So I realized what it was, but I still had to go back to the airport and land it to, to correct it. So, um, but the, the short answer is no, I've been lucky that way. Good for you. What, what, what do you enjoy most about the whole writing process? You know, I, I, I guess it would be getting things on paper that are complex, interesting, relating something that I know in a way that someone I don't know can understand it. So whether that is my father's escapes and making it both as, and I hate to use this word, but I'm about to, as entertaining as he used to make it, um, and convey the harrow and harrowingness, if that's a word, yeah. of what he went through. Um, that was a challenge. You know, I, in, in the editing process, did I convey enough how, how frightened I was for him walking the route and realizing that I was about to get to the intersection where he escaped the first time and, and putting myself in his shoes and then therefore putting the reader in his shoes? Could I pull that off? Or in this book, um, the complexity of reading the, the accident investigating, investigation reports and looking at some of their videos and reading their transcripts and merging them all into something that then puts a reader in the cockpit, the fly on the wall, or you're sitting in the jump seat while this is happening. That was, that's a challenge and I, and I enjoy that challenge and I enjoy reading reviews after and discovering that I've done it right. 
you know, a, a lot of the book, uh, you know, you, you, you put all the technology in a historical context. And, and, you know, much of the book tracks the history of, of aviation technology. Yeah. That must have been fun to do. I mean, tell me about that whole experience. Yeah, it actually was. I mean, so, okay, I'm a pilot and I happen to be an engineer, but it was fascinating to learn. Look, I, I know what all the instruments are in an airplane, but how did those instruments get there? It was actually surprising for me to learn that in the very beginning, in the early 1900s, I, okay, the Wright brothers, we know, had no instruments. But even the guys in 1908, 1910, they had no instruments. There was like no reason that they think they needed one. You could see, you could kind of see how fast you were going. You're doing 40 miles an hour. You really need a speedometer for 40 miles an hour. But so going from there to planes who were going 2,400 miles an hour, well, you need instruments for that. And so it was really fun to, to learn how those instruments were done, were, des were designed, to learn the role of gyroscopes. I, I talk about gyroscopes a little bit in history of what they are, what they do, why they work and why they're so important. Um, it, it, was, it was a lot of digging, but it was enjoyable digging. And, and what was most enjoyable was in putting all that together into cogent paragraphs that made sense. Great. Um, when it comes to writing and just when it comes to life in general, I guess, you know, who are some of your inspirations? Well, I guess the layup is the life in general. Uh, my dad, uh, you know, I mean, he, he went through oh, softball. Right? He, he went through hell and he was the funniest, nicest guy. He could tell a joke. He spoke nine languages and he could tell it. That, well, he spoke 10 if you include Greek, because he would say that if he didn't understand something, it was Greek to him. So, so, but he, but he spoke all these languages. He could tell jokes in every one of them, and he did. And he was a light, lighthearted, interesting, funny, engaging, entertaining guy who loved every day that he was alive. He used to have this thought, this thing he used to say, had all these sayings. And one of them was, it beats the alternative. No matter how bad your day is, no matter how bad your life feels like it might be, it right. beats the alternative. That's what he used to say. So he's my inspiration in life. In writing, I, I guess, well, so my favorite author of all time is John le Carre. Um, I love the spy novels he wrote, but I love the stuff he wrote after the spy novel genre kind of became a little, let's call it passe. He's, he writes very densely. He, he describes brilliantly scenes and people. And I just found that to be um, an unattainable goal, but, it, but an interesting one to try to attain. And then James Salter, um, who wrote, who's, uh, who's actually an Air Force pilot um, back in the Korean War and, became, and then became a very well-known writer. He writes very sparingly, very, very, he, he doesn't even tell you who in a dialogue, he might not tell you even at the beginning of the dialogue who's speaking. You need to know your, your characters well enough to know who's saying what. Um, but he writes that way, it's brilliant writing, he's considered a brilliant writer. Um, and so, although I'll never retain that quality of writing, I believe, um, he inspires me to be better than every time I write a, write a paragraph. Well, it gives you something to aspire to. You know? <laughs> there you just, go. Just, just when you see how, they, how someone writes and, and you say, boy, you know, whether, whether you're a writer or not, um, what a skill. You know, no and, and I know exactly what you mean when they don't identify the characters. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, they, they have it all mapped out and you sort of have to, you know, get into the story. It, 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 it's one thing when you're reading Ludlum and there's this dialogue back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But you start by saying, Bill said, <laughs> but 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 Salter won't even do that sometimes. He'll just he'll describe a scene and then he'll just one of the characters will say something. You gotta know who it is because you've got to know that character. No, I, I hear you. So next project, what's uh, what's next on the table for you? You know, I don't have anything. And I can't imagine given given the, the diversity of the two books you've you've written. I don't know where well, so I actually, I've, I've looked at some World War II stories of people who had significant roles that are not well known. I'm kicking around that. Um, I'm, I'm kicking around a couple of potential financial stories. Uh, you know, I, I've been in finance most of my career. Um, and so something human interest there, but I don't have anything definitive yet. But probably nonfiction again? Oh, it'll be nonfiction. I, I tried my hand at fiction 25 years ago. You know, I can get paragraphs down and I can get chapters down, but I can't get characters down, I think, off of my head and onto the paper the way I'd like to. So it's nice to have a character that's already fully formed. Well, the, these are these are two nonfiction books that, that they, they pretty much, the stories are so great, they seem to write themselves in terms of the drama and, and, and just the storytelling. So uh, well, thank you. best of luck. We, we, we're just about out of time. But again, I want to thank Jack Hirsch for, for your time today. I want to have people you know, keep in mind November 20th is when the book is 
uh, is available in the U.S. market. It's it's the danger of automation in airliners, and uh, I strongly recommend you pick it up. It's really a, a fascinating read. So thanks again, Jack. Thanks, thanks for having me, Jim. Okay, and until next time, this is Jim Alcon, and uh, we hope to see you again. Take care.